Um, my name's Paul Bates. I'm professor of hydrology at the University of Bristol, and I'm one of the CGFI co-investigators. Um, and a pleasure to introduce the session today looking at wind and flood risks, and particularly their combined impact. And we've got a great panel to talk to us uh, this afternoon. And the programme we're going to go through is each of the panel members is going to make a, a very short presentation um, about some of the work that they've done or their, their perspectives on this issue. And then we're going to move to a panel discussion and Q&A uh, where I and my co-host, Professor Len Shaffrey, sitting over here, are going to take uh, some questions from the audience, from the panel on this topic. So the session is about combating wind and flood risks, implications, understanding and analytics from research to business. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is Professor Jennifer Cato from the University of Exeter, Department of Mathematics and Statistics. So Jennifer is part of the Storm Risk Group, and her work it combines observations and models to look at the impacts of extreme weather on climate, both now and into the future. So with that, Jennifer, over the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I think there should be some slides... Yes, okay, so um, my research is really thinking about joint hazards um, from a weather perspective. Um, so weather and climate uh, research is, is where I uh, come at this from. Um, so I'm also slightly uh, one step further removed from the impacts um, because I think about the precipitation rather than the, the floods, but um, we don't get flooding in land without some precipitation. So. Um, my research is really looking at uh, linking precipitation and wind joint ex uh, extremes to their drivers. So there's a lot of evidence, um, various different ways of looking at the co-occurrence of precipitation and wind extremes um, indicate that in the mid-latitudes, so affecting um, North America, um, Northwestern Europe um, and other locations, there's a... Um, a maximum in the co-occurrence of extreme precipitation. Um, and so you can see that in, on the left, the sort of um, green and yellow colours, and on the right in the, the red colours, you can see where there's a high uh, incidence of co-occurring extreme wind and precipitation. So we need to understand the drivers of these um, co-occurring extremes. Um, so are the extremes caused by common drivers so that they are more likely in certain situations and this can, can help um, estimate the risk from them? Um, so we need to understand this better uh, to quantify both the present day risk and also um, future risk. Um, so changes in the driving weather systems in the future might affect um, the risk of getting co-occurring uh, extreme events. So I, I do this by thinking about um, different weather systems and, and this is just an example uh, it hasn't come out correctly um, but I think about um, extratropical cyclones frontal systems and um, so warm and cold fronts that we, we get very frequently over the UK uh, and Europe and also thunderstorm environments and how these different weather systems combine um, to change or uh, to change our risk of uh, compound events um, so this is the wrong figure on the left because we've gone from MAC to PC and so the figures don't come out correctly. Um, so what I wanted to show you is that when we think about um, extratropical cyclones and fronts, um, what the figure on the left is meant to show is that uh, cyclones and fronts combine together and also fronts on their own um, are the most common weather type for producing co-occurring precipitation and wind events in winter um, in the mid-latitudes. So in the area of um, the UK and Northwestern Europe, um, co-occurring extreme precipitation and wind is mostly associated with extratropical cyclones. And another study on the right, um, the purple outlined box shows the proportion of winter events associated with extratropical cyclones. Again, um, and this shows that um, a very high proportion of co-occurring precipitation and wind events are associated with um, extratropical cyclones. So there's various different ways of looking at this from a weather system perspective, but they kind of they give 
the same answers. Um, so is it that the, um, the wind is causing the precipitation or, or vice versa, or is it that they have a common driver? Um, so the research that we've done shows that actually um, the proportion of extreme precipitation events that also have extreme wind events is much larger for these extratropical cyclone systems um, and lower for more tropical systems, um, which is different to when we have, say, a wave wind compound extreme um, where the weather system type does not influence the rate of co-occurrence. So that suggests that the mid-latitude weather system is actually the driver of the, is the common driver of the extreme precipitation and wind compound hazard. So research that's ongoing, um, I put up this um, figure on the right just to, to illustrate the type of weather system that we're talking about. So this is an extratropical cyclone um, with the low pressure in the centre, warm fronts and cold fronts. Um, and so we're doing work to try and understand more about the characteristics of the driving extratropical cyclones so that we can better understand um, the potential risk of these events from um, the weather systems. So we're doing that looking at a storm-centred point of view, which is what's shown on the left, um, to see um, where these co-occurring extremes happen within um, extratropical cyclones. And then hopefully we can find out more information about other characteristics. So is it the strongest storms? Is it when they're coming from particular directions? What is, what is um, the impact on the... Um, what causes the higher risk of compound extremes? And we're also doing research looking at the impact of climate change on these co-occurring hazards in the future. And some um, research that's not published yet, but um, thanks to Colin Manning, um, it shows an increase in the footprints of co-occurring um, extreme wind and extreme precipitation in the future. So that's what the, the panel on the right shows, um, an increase in the, the frequency of these co-occurring events. So we want to understand better the characteristics of the storms that drive these co-occurring um, hazards so that we can estimate our risk um, both in present day and in the future. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Um, so now we move on to Dr. Hannah Bloomfield, who's now of the University of Newcastle as of the start of this month. Um, Hannah was, uh, up until then, the uh, CGFI postdoc at the University of Bristol, working with Len and I. Uh, and Hannah is going to move now from thinking about wind and precip to thinking further into the impact space and about wind and flood and actually wind and loss. Hannah, over to you. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming to this session. Um, yeah, so as Paul said, until about 12 days ago, I was the CGFI wind flood postdoc. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the stuff that we've been doing over the last 18 months. Um, so I know it's quite a mixed group of people. So in case you were kind of, you know, it's late in the day, kind of wondering what is one of these wind flood events in reality? And maybe what does it mean for you? So a good, a good example of one of these might be um, storms Dudley, Eunice and Franklin. So in 20, February 2022, we had a series of storms coming through. So we've got some pictures of things that are a bit broken associated with these storms, which um, potentially caused you all quite a lot of headaches. Um, but also you can see weather maps here and you can see overlapping regions of different weather warnings. Um, so particularly for Storm Eunice and Storm Franklin here, you can kind of see overlapping regions of a wind rain warning um, and maybe these kind of wind slow regions. So um, for us, a compound weathered event in this context is when you've um, got these two kind of hazards either happening in an overlapping region um, or maybe at the same time or maybe within a given time period. Um, so when I started this postdoc, uh, first job was to read lots of papers and there's actually a reasonable amount of literature from the academic community thinking about wind flood. Um, so it's like we planned this. Some of these papers are the ones Jen was talking about earlier um, by a PhD student, Laura Owen. Um, there's a lot of work thinking about very much weather variables. So thinking about like uh, wind and precipitation, you know, this kind of climate science perspective. Um, but I was then employed in a hydrology group um, so really, if you're thinking about flooding um, and you want to move towards impact, you should maybe start to think about how that precipitation impacts river flows. So there's a few studies kind of in this camp. Uh, John Hillier's here today, I think. 
Um, but when you really go down to these maybe damage relevant metrics, stuff that you might be able to implement in um, your kind of studies, I, th I think CBES was a prime example of this, like what papers do we write that maybe have usable metrics for you if you were conducting that kind of exercise? There's not many, right? Um, there's two here, well done John. Um, and they all use various different statistics. Um, it, it was quite difficult to try and synthesize this. So I spent some time in CGFI trying to synthesize this work um, across all different timescales and lots of different impact measures. Um, so you might have seen this already, but this is our CGFI Wind Flood Correlation Explorer. So if you're bored of me talking, you can scan the QR code and play with it. Um, but what this allows you to do is to see all the results from the papers we've written. Um, so you can choose a time scale of interest. You can think about um, either here we've got weather variables, we've got gust versus precipitation. But you can also think about some more impact focus variables. So as part of the project, um, we worked a lot with storm severity indices, which are a common way of the insurance community thinking about wind damage. We also developed a novel flood severity index. So a similar thing, thinking about river flows exceeding critical percentiles and how that may then relate to potential for damage over an area. So if you play for this for a long time, you've kind of accidentally done some science and you can then claim, you can make come to these conclusions. So you can see from it some example maps here. This one's looking at gusts and precipitation. The, the values are different across Europe. And this kind of relates back to what Jen was talking about. Depending on where you are in Europe, the drivers of what causes your wind flood correlation and the strength of this are different. So the numbers are highest, like closest to a value of one um, down the west coast. And this is where we get most storms interacting um, with the uh, coming off the North Atlantic. You can see how that these two maps are different though, right? So once you go gust versus river flow, the results are different. So, and generally, as your metrics become more impact focused, the correlation values do drop, but we still see significant correlation between wind and flood. Why is this important for you? Well, generally, when you're modeling these hazards, these are done as separate models, right? You have a cat model for wind and a cat model for flood. We're providing some evidence of here of why you might want to stick them together. In terms of what drives this, Jen has talked a bit, um, but um, in the paper, we unpack um, for different timescales from this maybe storm-centred start. It's all storms, really. It's just about how many storms we're getting um, at longer timescales. The hydrology starts to become a bit more important. So if you're going to have a big compound event, it might need to be conditioned by having particular um, soggy catchments, um, so they're not able to absorb any more water, and then you're more likely to flood. On the very long time scales, that might be related to the position of the jet stream, um, phases of critical modes of variability, like the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, and we're about to submit a piece of work that unpacks the meteorological drivers of our very extreme storm severity and flood severity index work um, to show that basically there are particular locations of cyclones that lead to the most um, intense UK compound events. The very final bit, I guess, is um, although I'm doing more impact focused um, work here with CGFI, it's still a little bit removed from what you guys do every day. Um, so the final thing I was doing as I left and still now because I didn't finish it on time um, is working on the potential to do this toy loss model. So we've been building event sets, uh, a more traditional input to a catastrophe model than these time series I was showing before. Um, but we've built the first kind of compound wind flood event set where the, all the sites in all these dots are different catchments, river catchment sites around the UK. And we can um, build a statistical model that conditions so you've got extreme events based on both the wind and the flood being extreme at different sites. We can combine this with open, act open access exposure and vulnerability data, which I caveat is very difficult to find. Um, to get our first kind of estimates of how compound losses may compare to um, these losses from individual models. So this is work in progress. Um, maybe come to the forum next year and we'll tell you the answer. Um, but yeah, hopefully leading towards more impact focus work. The last thing I'll say before I hand over is if this kind of thing is interesting, 
Um, please check out a CGFI event we have a recording from for. This was a grand challenges meeting where we spent quite a lot of time talking about compound wind flood as well as some other big issues. Um, and this was in combination with the Royal Met Stock Special Interest Group. Yeah. So that's all from me. I'll pass on to Jess. Thank you very much, Hannah. So now, now we're going to move from the, the science of uh, wind and flood risk to how those are viewed within the industry. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Dr. Jessica Turner from Guy Carpenter to give the next talk. So Jessica is head of the Catastrophe Advisory at Guy Carpenter, who is one of our most experienced CAT modellers and has previously worked at willis Ree, RMS and Lloyds Banking Group as well. Jessica, Great. thank you very much. Speak to you today. I hope you've been having a great session so far. Um, so as Paul said, I mean, I am a meteorologist by training, actually, but I've been spending the last 15 years in the insurance industry and cat modeling industry, um, thinking about how uh, these hazards impact insurance. And so that's mostly what I'm going to focus on today. But I wanted to first start and give a little bit of a framing. Now, I'm going to stick here to the mid-latitudes, like the previous two speakers. I think tropical cyclones is kind of a slightly different issue. If we're thinking about Europe and about mid-latitudes, when we talk about wind flood correlation, there's actually some nuance there. So there's different types of wind flood correlation. And those have impacts. They have financial impacts. So the first one we should think about is really, are we talking about seasonal correlation, or are we talking about event correlation? So seasonal here, let's say for over the winter season, you know, from November to March, it's windier and wetter than usual, but not necessarily at the same time, meaning there's a series of low pressure systems coming through. Sometimes you get wind damage, sometimes flood damage, but they're not co-occurring. And that's important because that's going to impact the profitability of an insurance company. When we're talking about event co-occurrence or correlation, it's when the same storm, say Eunice in one of the previous examples, um, or Desmond, which caused the Boxing Day flooding in the UK, that's when you have wind and flood simultaneously. And that's more important for reinsurance. So you're more likely to be able to claim on your reinsurance program if you have an event. So for us in the industry, it matters if we're talking about seasonal correlation or event correlation. Another thing to think about is, is, are we talking about the winter season or are we talking about the summer season? Because you can have wind flood correlation in both cases. So in the winter, this tends to be caused more by large scale synoptic frontal events. And you've seen a, a few images previously. But we can also have wind losses in Europe associated with convective storms in the summer. So these will be small scale convective storms causing hail, straight line winds, tornadoes, and flood losses from extreme precipitation. So with those in mind, um, I'm now going to talk through a little bit about the losses. Um, so, oh, I did have one point to make, sorry. Um, so uh, as Hannah said previously, with the exception of tropical cyclones and coastal flooding, where the correlation is generally taken into account, most of our contestory models assume independence of wind and flood models. And I've said most kind of as a hedge, because I actually don't know any models that do that one might exist. But in my experience, all the vendor models have those as completely separate, the wind and the inland flood. Uh, and there are some good reasons for that and some less good reasons. I think a good reason is that uh, the vendor models would say, well, usually the storms that cause really damaging winds over Europe are fast moving, and they tend not to dump a lot of rain in one location, whereas a big flood event will come from a stationary front sitting over a location for several days. But I think we've seen it's not, they are not 100% independent. We know that from the hazard already. So I'd argue that it's something we should start to think about and take into consideration. What I want to do is talk about hazard correlation as seen through the losses. I think we've seen that we can see that in the hazard data, but do we see that in real world losses? So what I'm showing you on the screen here is UK household losses as provided by the Association of British Insurers. Um, I removed the scale because this is data by subscription, but it, it sort of doesn't matter because what I'm trying to do is show the correlation between storm and flood, where storm is in the purple and flood is in the blue. Now you've got winter season losses on the left-hand side and summer losses on the, on the right-hand side. So this is a seasonal metric. Uh, you should also take into account the fact that the data is untrended. So I haven't taken into account changes in currency or the built environment. But because we would trend storm and flood in the same way, I think it's fine to leave it out because we're just looking at the correlations here. 
And if you do a really simple correlation just in Excel, that's all I did, <laughs> you'll see that there's, there's decent correlation. You've got 0.5 for the winter season and maybe a surprising 0.8 for the summertime losses. So that's interesting. That's an indication we are seeing correlation between these perils um, in our losses. But you do have to be careful because the ABI defines storm as gusts over 55 miles per hour or rain above 25 millimeters per hour. So we don't really know. A loss adjuster on the ground might see precipitation, surface water flooding, and might be calling this storm. So there is probably some contamination in the data. What about real world examples? Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the summer of 2021, which was really an extraordinary summer for continental Europe, which was characterized by extreme hail, wind, tornado throughout essentially all of June um, and even into July. This was a really interesting meteorological situation where there was a heat wave over continental Europe, very hot. There was a stationary high over the Balkans, which set up a jet stream coming from the southwest. And one low pressure system after another brought cold, moist air with a cold front over the warm continental Europe, just driving precipitate convection cell after convection cell with heavy precipitation, straight line winds, and hail. And I've written down all of the low pressure systems because I would never remember them all. We had Stefan on the 18th of June, Fanonant on the 19th of June, Ulfert on the 20th of June, Volker and Wolfgang the 21st to 25th of June, followed by Zero the 28th to 1st of July. And at the end of that extraordinary series, there was 3.5 billion euros of insured loss in continental Europe. And then the whole series was capped off by extreme flooding in July um, by the storm Burned. And this was the famous German flooding which happened in 2021 in Germany and in Belgium where unfortunately more than 180 people lost their lives. So the, here's a real world example where we see we've got hail, we've got wind, tornado, flood all happening at the same time. The flood, according to the CAP models, would be modeled completely separate from the hail, the wind, and the other perils. And clearly that's not correct. Uh, what about modeling studies? So a few studies have been undertaken to use CAP models to investigate this uh, issue a little bit more. So I'm going to highlight one that's undertaken by the Bank of England um, with some academics and also the modeling firm Verisk. And here they're looking at seasonal correlation. So what they're doing is taking the output, um, uh, the simulation output from a wind model and a flood model, and they're matching up the years such that they're forcing correlation, so essentially resampling. And they assume either a 20% correlation, which is the bottom two bars, or a 40% correlation, which is the top two bars. And you can see the impacts on the net loss uh, in orange and the gross loss in the blue on the 200-year return period annual aggregate loss. Now, these numbers are relatively moderate. You know, we're talking about 3% to 6%, and maybe that doesn't sound like a lot, but the 200-year return period annual aggregate loss is the solvency capital, which must be held by firms. So a 6% increase, you could be talking about easily hundreds of millions of pounds for a firm. Um, Event correlation, so this is a study that Guy Carpenter did, specifically looking now not at seasonal correlation, but at event correlation. And the first thing we did was look at ERA-5 reanalysis, which is the historical observations from 1979 to, to 2020. And we calculated the conditional probability of extreme precipitation, precipitation over the 98th percentile, given daily maximum gust exceeds 20 meters per second, which is generally considered the threshold to be damaging. And we found some some decent, um, some decent correlations between the two. Some areas, particularly around topography, the correlation is very high. Um, but over much of Europe, you're looking at around 0.5. So we did the same thing as the Bank of England. We just did a resampling of the wind model output and the flood model output. But here we did it on an event basis rather than seasonal. And the picture we found was a bit different. We found pretty small increases, actually, in the event losses when we correlated the wind and flood. So you can see from the table, um, ranging from 0% to plus 3%, depending on the return period and the country you look at. And the reason for that was that the wind losses so dominate uh, Europe, the, the magnitude is so much larger than flood losses, that even when you correlated them on an event basis, uh, the impact was relatively modest. So 
my last slide is just to talk a little bit about what are the financial implications of the wind-flood correlation. Uh, the first two points, increased property damage and increased business interruption. The last two modeling studies I showed you assumed still independence of vulnerability, meaning even when the event co-occurred, you didn't get the compound effects to the vulnerability, to the damageability of the property. And of course, that's not true, because you might have heavy precipitation at a location which wouldn't have flooded the building, but for the roof being blown off. So that's an example. And of course, increased business interruption. If you've got a flooded property, but you've got trees down blocking the road, you can't get to it and you can't make repairs. And then my last three points are around um, sort of the profit and loss daily management of a business. So if you have correlation of wind and flood, you've got increased volatility in your financial returns, which investors do not like. You might have increased capital requirements, as I've shown previously, and you can have poorly structured or priced uh, reinsurance. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And, and last, but by no means least, somebody we, we've already heard from a little bit today and probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Rowan Douglas, CBE from uh, no longer Willis Towers Watson. <laughs> That's right. But then, I, I didn't know I was making a presentation, <laughs> but I will, I will say a few words. You will say a few words on, uh, uh, on your thoughts yeah, on no, this topic. No, thanks so much, Paul. Um, <laughs> you've heard me say this once before, but my biggest claim to fame was doing my uh, MPhil Viva, the same day that Paul did his PhD Viva in Bristol just a few years ago. Um, yeah, no, absolutely fabulous presentations. I don't have a presentation and, and we'll make some comments on the, on the panel. But I guess there are, um, my, my background's re reinsurance um, uh, way back when. I suppose perhaps to the, to the general audience, there's perhaps just three, three comments I'd make. And it's been fabulous to see this focus on on such a driving peril or, or hazard of, of wind and, and flood in a combination. Um, and quite rightly, there is a tremendous focus on understanding the hazard or, or the peril, and you know, it's, a, it's, a climate, uh, it's a climate conference. But when understanding that the risk to uh, individual properties or crops or whatever, when we, when we go through risk modeling, it's also critically important to understand the attributes of those exposed assets or populations or even natural assets. Probably the biggest revolution the insurance sector had to go through and why you have to spend far too long filling out your insurance application form is to capture the attributes of those exposed assets. And then critically, and they were touched on in a number of the, of the talks by uh, uh, Jennifer, Jessica, and oh my goodness me, I've had a, a mental blank. Hannah, excuse me, um, is to understand the vulnerability functions that actually affect those assets to those particular hazards. And if you want to understand the, the secret source that often changes so much the outputs of expected losses and ultimately to the point that Jessica made, and maybe not everybody picked it up, insurance companies do have, to, unlike all other financial sector institutions, insurers and reinsurers, re reinsurers do have to hold capital from the model. So we talk a lot about, you know, will there be a capital charge against some of these risks? For insurers, there are. And the outputs of the models drive exactly how much capital uh, an insurance or insurance company has to hold. And so often it's the, it's the effect of the vulnerability functions and assumptions that change the biggest thing with, with the outcome. So, but for non-insurance institutions, capturing that data on their exposed in exposure within their portfolios is often the most challenging thing. So second thing, second thing I'd say, uh, and it was, it, it, was, it was picked up as well, is we will have to think very imaginatively about the triggers and thresholds, which we, and imaginatively, the triggers and thresholds we develop that will allow, whether it be financial institutions or even countries. Uh, I was in Bonn last week at the, at, the, at the UNFCC summit talking about loss and damage. And what are the sorts of triggers we could develop to enable us to impute what the expected losses are from, in this case, wind and flood losses to economies to make sure that they, they, they understand what those key thresholds are and manage to them and try and uh, become more resilient, but ultimately can receive appropriate entitlements to cash 
uh, including from the global north when events occur. And we have to spend a lot of time working through what those thresholds could be uh, to provide those triggers. The third point I wanted to, wanted to say was it is vital that, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's conference, whatever financial sector institution we come from or, 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 or public sector body, we become uh, more like geographers as well as economists and we get the physics into finance. And it's important that, um, and, and Jessica, your journey from sort of science through to reinsurance, a little time at banking uh, and, uh, and, and back into the reinsurance world was instructive. Every bank, every investor will have to hire uh, hydrologists as much as meteorologists, uh, as much as economists. But I do sense that it will probably be the requirement to ensure these sorts of risks far beyond our existing requirement, unusually in the UK, to require flood insurance and other natural hazard insurance for mortgages and other um, financial commitments. I sense it'll be the insurance and reinsurance sector quite broadly defined that becomes effectively the risk management valve through which other financial institutions decide whether they will uh, take on a, uh, a loan or, or some other financial commitment. Because I think the requirement and cost of modeling and uh, human personnel required to truly get to grips with flood and wind risk will mean that I think that that sector, which is already, we did some back of the envelope statistics a few years ago and worked out that the insurance and reinsurance, insurance and reinsurance, reinsurance sector around the world already spends, and this was three or four years ago, $2 billion a year on risk modeling, catastrophe risk modeling. That includes all the hundreds of millions of dollars they have to spend on uh, catastrophe risk models, maybe, but maybe not quite so much if, if Tom has his way, um, but also all, all the personnel and all the other requirements. It was about $2 billion a year. It's a massive investment, and that wasn't necessarily with a forward gear looking into the future of climate. That was just looking at current levels of uh, extreme risk. So I think it's going to be unlikely that all other sectors want to make that same or even larger commitment. And I think the CGFI is perfectly placed to allow the banking and investment sector to take full advantage of the commitments that the insurance and reinsurance sector will have to make, but also add facets and components to make sure that the, the gearbox that is used can translate this to the decision making in a bank or an investor as much as it has in the reinsurance world. And even in that world, we're having to understand how to put a proper uh, forward gear onto the gearbox. The gearbox is basically right, but it's, um, it's, it's currently got lots of reverse gears and it needs a few more uh, forward gears. So um, there we go. That was my uh, painting picture with words. So now I'd like to invite the panel to join oh. us on the stage. So Rowan, uh, not so fast. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was off the hook. back up here. Okay. Um, off to you and we're going to, uh, I'm going to hand over to Len uh, to do a little bit of Q&A. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Lynn Shaffrey from the University of Reading, the National Centre for Atmospheric Science. Um, so as our panellists make <coughs> their way to the stage, I'll just say that we've got roughly about half an hour uh, for questions and answers in this panel session. Um, I've got a couple of prepared questions um, to ask the panellists, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the floor. So you've got a few minutes to think um, really difficult, uh, tricky questions that you've always wanted to ask about <laughs> wind and flood risk. So I guess to start off with, uh, I, I guess, um, Anna, one of the things that came from your presentation, when you sort of showed the, the, the kind of the, 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 the published literature, just how recent all those studies are, I mean, it kind of brings home just how recent uh, a subject this is. It's, it's kind of over the past decade, we've started to understand a lot more about correlated risk in Europe in terms of wind and flood. Um, so I guess that I kind of wanted to ask everybody on the panel, um, from your point of view, where are the big knowledge gaps? There's obviously a lot more that we could learn about, about wind and flood risk, because there's lots going on in the science, but clearly a lot's going on in uh, financial institutions, particularly in the insurance industry. So from your perspective, where are the big knowledge gaps and how are we going to make progress? So maybe, uh, maybe Jen, I guess, can we start with the meteorology? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I think, I think there's still a lot. So, so compound hazards and compound events have kind of really had a lot of attention in the last few years um, in various different 
places and, and not just the compound um, wind flood events. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the problems that we have when looking at compound events is the data. So because when you're looking at extreme events, you're already limiting your data sample. And if you want to look at the top 1% um, strongest wind events, if you then want to look at those joint with um, flooding events, you're really limiting the data that you can use. And so we, I think one of the one of the problems is really understanding how um, how these events do correlate um, with such a small data sample. Um, so I think that's um, that's a gap. Um, so making use of large ensembles of um, model data. Um, we've actually had a project with Guy Carpenter to do this using seasonal forecast models um, to generate more, like a larger event set using physical models. Um, yeah, so that from the meteorological point of view, I think that's, that's one of the issues is looking at the weather systems and the, the lack of data. Yeah, um, yeah and, and making use of physical models to actually make yeah. some progress on that. Yeah, I guess to extend that, if you if you make the assumption that you can get to the weather data, if we say if we take that one as a given, and okay, okay, we've managed to find a nice large ensemble that we can do some analysis with. I think one of the things I found most difficult, uh, and with the cone I showed, is trying to get towards the impact. So with these correlated hazards, like just generally wind and flood are very correlated, right? Generally, when it's a bit windier, it, it might be raining as well, like just winter weather versus summer weather. But in terms of the events that actually cause damage, um, we're into the tail and we don't have that many um, industry observations at this point. Like, um, I showed some very dodgy looking vulnerability curves that I've been making, but to find open data we can use in academia to try and calibrate something you know and understand like for a given event um, you know we, we've got this event we know what we think happened meteorologically was there actually a loss um, that's it that's incredibly difficult for us so I think a big gap um, in the modeling mm -hmm. yeah I think um, I'm very grateful for the studies that have come out recently I think it's been very interesting and I'm glad it's a topic that's being explored mm -hmm. I think it's less of a problem about limited data sets because in a way that's what catastrophe models are for I mean they're built to look at extreme events and I, I sort of think we've got enough on the hazard side that we could build correlated catastrophe models and I think do a decent job I think the problem is really implementation mm -hmm. um, the desire to do it and I think it's it's because historically developers have seen wind and flood as not being that correlated when, when it comes to losses um, so maybe some of these studies are going to help motivate change there. Uh, and I also think it's just, it's already hard enough to build a flood model or to build a wind model. <laughs> you know, it's 15 PhDs working for five years on these things. And I do think they're, they're conscious that that needs to be done and that's maybe a next mm -hmm. step that's coming. I mean, another thing is that traditionally meteorologists and hydrologists are coming from slightly different academic backgrounds mm -hmm. and they can tend to be a bit <laughs> siloed. I think, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to working together. <laughs> <laughs> Present company accepted. Uh, Rowan? I have absolutely nothing useful to add. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, I'm going to move to the ne next question. Yeah. Apart from to say, of course, let me focus on the correlation between these two types of parable. Of course, uh, if, you, if you're looking at an international uh, or even global portfolio, another dimension of correlation, which will be touched on, I'm sure, on another, another panel on another day, is is that we've looked at it for many years, haven't we, the challenges of, of understanding the correlation spatially in any given year, the sort of teleconnections. It's a different subject, mm -hmm. just to add, add further, but we're talking now here about the, the correlation very importantly about, um, uh, if you like, co-located perils. The other challenge that we'll also have is to understand what are the potential correlations are, are around the world, both for this sort of peril, but more broadly, but uh, no, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. So I guess moving on to something that kind of CGFI is thinking about in great detail is around climate change. Uh, I mean, from your perspectives, I mean, do you feel as the climate change and it warms, will, will compound risk become a, a bigger issue? Or will it be something that perhaps we'll consider less? Mm -hmm. Is it something that's going to come higher on the research agenda? One of the, the studies that I showed that we did at Guy Carpenter, we also, we didn't look just at the historical observations and the correlation, mm -hmm. we also used CMIP-6 uh, and looked at the same correlations and we did see that 
you know, storms were tending to get wetter, as I guess you would expect. I mean, that's kind of an obvious consequence. So it did seem to, to drive up the losses a little bit. It wasn't as much as one would expect. But I think what worries me more from the climate change perspective is more about the attritional losses. It's more the seasonal correlation rather than the events correlation. And we're just seeing more smaller events, but they add up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just to echo that, it's part of the study we talked about there um, where we're thinking about these correlations between these storm severity and flood severity. So we did that using the UK climate projections, mm -hmm. the UK CP18 data set, which is a single model rather than a suite of future mm -hmm. climate models. But that one showed if you look at your most extreme compounds, um, a fourfold increase in the future, which is mainly driven by um, the flood severity index getting much higher so it's just generally much wetter um, so we had a similar number of these wind events but just more floods so more likely that they would then be a compounding mm -hmm. um, similarly with the seasonal time scales that then adds up to just yeah. catchments generally being wetter but yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah unpacking the antecedent conditions I think is really interesting for this um, and seeing if we could maybe understand a little bit better when something really bad might be coming yeah, I, th I think the evidence is really building that um, co-occurring extreme events are going to become more common within particular storms. Um, so there's also the shift of the storm track that's going to impact where these events are occurring. So some of the some of the impacts will depend on where you have the vulnerability or the exposure. I mean, um, so. Um, but there's, there's quite a lot of evidence to show that um, the storm tracks are going to intensify over northwestern Europe and so um, and with that increased precipitation intensity and larger footprints of strong winds so I think I think these compound events will become more important in mm -hmm. the future. No, it's incredibly exciting to see how these higher resolution climate models are just giving us this sort of crystal ball mm -hmm. into into the <laughs> near term, let alone medium term future, I just highlight that the intellectual challenge is, is to marry climate models. They may be quite high resolution, but compared to risk models, they're, they're very low resolution. And, and, the, and the magic is to use high resolution climate models to inform our, our risk models and our, our stochastic event sets and the rest. And, and, and that's the sort of work that I think is so critical that the CGFI can, 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 can bring together. So, but of course, what will also drive the loss, it's not quite such a fashionable topic, is how our, expose, how our exposure uh, evolves. Maybe not quite so much in, in more mature economies and geographies like the UK, but certainly in, in developing and emerging uh, economies, it, it's the changing rapid nature of, of uh, urbanization uh, uh, as well as um, changes in, in agricultural use that are actually having a massive impact on the level of loss. Of course the changing hazard is also critical too mm -hmm. and somehow we've got to marry all these elements together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interestingly when we've looked in the United States for flood alone um, the, the losses due to population change, the increase in loss due to population change is about four times that of the increases due to climate. Interesting. So uh, even yeah. in developed economies, mm. which are growing rapidly, yeah. that, that is mm. also yeah. pans out. Yeah. I think that's a really nice segue into the question that I was going to ask next, before, before I take questions from the floor, um, is we've kind of talked here quite you know, specifically kind of European and UK wind and inland flooding. Um, what are the compound hazards or compound risks should we be looking at? What, what's, what should be on our radar? I, I think um, thinking about in the future, future risks with climate change, compound coastal flooding is one that will be a particular issue um, with intensifying rainfall and um, more flooding inland plus storm surge, higher sea levels, that co compound coastal flooding is going to be an issue. Um, and there's been research on that in the UK Climate Resilience Programme. Um, uh, looking at uh, different coastal, compound coastal flooding events around the UK. Um, but then also heat and humidity and heat and drought, which impact on um, agriculture in particular. And, and again, in the UKCR research, um, there, there's been 
um, projects looking at that and the impact on potatoes and cattle and things like that. So yeah, I think there's there's other definitely other compound events that are going to be important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for winter compounding, so we're just starting a project with John Hillier, who's maybe sitting somewhere. Oh, he's over there. Hello, John. Looking at lots of winter compounds, so potentially ones that stick out are maybe cold, wet and cold, dry events for causing disruption, um, maybe not large loss and damage, but potential to disrupt rail sectors. So I'm an energy meteorologist by training, so I mean, we're talking about net zero a lot today. In theory, if, if you want to keep the lights on in a very sustainable way, the biggest compound event for the UK is cold weather and low wind, right? So it's not damaging in the traditional sense, but if we do move towards something where you have got actual carbon credits that work, and that would, uh, a very low wind event for a long period could seriously impact the finance sector. I don't have anything to add. I think there's some very interesting, <laughs> interesting remarks. Yeah. I mean, I can add in, I, I think in the future, um, with an increasingly volatile hydrological cycle, you could get many more years in which there are both co-occurring drought and flood episodes. Mm -hmm. And that could be interesting mm -hmm. for some insurers because with dry weather becomes subsidence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, agricultural losses are also problematic. Yeah. So seasons or years where we get co-occurring drought and flood is uh, could well be yeah. something to look at. Yeah, that swing between drought and flood, particularly sort of soil compaction and kind yeah. of runoff and things like this is a whole stack of issues though. Yeah. I'm going to see whether there are any questions uh, from the floor. Oh gosh, lots of hands yeah, going up. <laughs> Quinton, I think, <laughs> I think you were first there. And I think it might have been John. And I'm sorry, I missed... Oh gosh, there's lots of hands. Hello, uh, Quinton Ray, P1 Investment Management. Now, I, I, I've actually got two questions, so you can have a choice if you don't want to. One for Jennifer and one for Hannah. Um, leaning on some rather ancient geophysical fluid dynamics knowledge. So, uh, take your pick. <laughs> Who'd like to start? Jennifer or Hannah? Or? <laughs> they want, they want to know the question first. What's the question? <laughs> okay, well, no, I'll, well, I'll start with Jennifer's question. Then, shall I? Um, it made me think about energetics, so you're asking about the, the cause for the co-occurrence of both wind and precipitation. Um, so I thought to myself, well, maybe the common cause is to do with the state of the energetics of the atmosphere, because obviously strong wind carries heat, and latent heat of evaporation and condensation carries heat. So maybe it's, I mean, this kind of goes back to how I did geophysical fluid dynamics, which is if you imagine some kind of a surface at a constant latitude going vertically up, and you ask yourself, could there be, you know, what would maximize the heat transfer going through that surface? And how would the atmosphere set itself up like that as your cause for the common cause for the two things? Does that sort of make sense? Is that an idea being explored? Um, so, so I guess when it comes to um, our extratropical cyclones and low pressure systems, we've got a fairly good idea of where we expect to see the strong winds um, and also the precipitation. It, it's um, the structure of the cyclones and the, the frontal systems. You, you get rainfall where you've got uplift and um, so sometimes the stronger the winds, the more the uplift. Um, so there's, there's that connection. Um, but also to get the heavy precipitation, you need a lot of moisture. So the, um, where the uh, storm is coming from is really important. Um, but yeah, understanding a bit more about the, um, the characteristics specifically, so why do some storms produce extremes and others don't, um, is yeah, still a topic of um, right. current research. Yes, you've yeah. obviously got to get your moisture from somewhere. And yeah. I, I'm thinking mostly of sort of uh, energetics moving uh, north from the south. Um, okay, well, the, uh, the question I had for Hannah was about co-occurrence co and floods and droughts, because you're looking at the correlations. And what struck me was you get a situation maybe where you've had a drought, because it dries out the, uh, the uh, soil a lot. And I think the panel almost touched on it, and I don't know to what it's been, extent it's been researched. But then obviously if you get heavy precipitation that follows, which you could easily imagine, you've got a sort of flash flood situation. 
So you, you talked about the, the memory and the catchment, and that seemed to, I mean, obviously that's perhaps a slight tangent from your work, but I wondered whether there was anything on that that was sort of coming through. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely going to defer this to my hydrologist ex-boss as <laughs> I'm a climate scientist. But Seems fair. It, is a, it is a good point, though. I think like a lot because it's winter, a lot of the time we were assuming with what I was talking about there that you are getting storms, particularly in these clustering periods, like um, Desmond was part of a cluster, mm. right? And then you get this tipping event where finally everything is saturated. Um, but yeah, Paul, do you want to say anything about winter flash flooding? Um, yeah, so, so combined switches between drought and flood is a current active topic of academic research. I'm not aware of the studies that are ongoing. They're just starting to produce information and putting it out in conferences. So that there's nothing really I can direct you to at the moment. But there's a growing awareness of it and of an issue, and there's research ongoing at the moment. Uh, but yeah, so you're absolutely right, and as Len said, you know, drought conditions, very hard, uh, compacted soils. You could get very uh, extreme rainfall afterwards. You could get a lot of runoff. Interesting as well, and guys probably won't uh, appreciate this, but where you get wildfires, actually wildfires create hydrophobicity in soils. So water runs off more from mm -hmm. burned land than from natural terrain. So, so the uh, worst possible outcome is mm -hmm. drought, wildfire. Yeah. yeah, so if you, have, if you have wildfires over large areas, as you might in California, then one of the risks that you might be concerned about in the winter season afterwards is increased runoff because of hydrophobic soils. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much, everyone. So I think, I think John Hillier was next. And then... Okay, uh, thank you. Quick question. How would you define event? What time frame and why? It's going to be fascinating for me to hear what's most relevant and interesting to you from your, your viewpoint and perspective, and that's to any one of the panel who cares to answer it. What's that? I laughed because I'm putting together a, an event from the ISCM, the International Society of Catastrophe Managers, this autumn to deal with exactly that. So from a meteorological perspective, it might be quite different. From an insurance perspective, you know, we have contracts and there's wordings in those contracts, and it is a matter of great debate. <laughs> really. So in some cases it's atmospheric disturbance, so you argue about that afterwards. Um, we had some clients that I mentioned that an entire string of severe weather over the summer of 2021. We had some clients that wanted to argue it was one event because it was one atmospheric disturbance, if you like, which was the southwesterly jet. Um, and so they thought they should recover all of that from their reinsurance treaties. Um, some people want to go to named storm even in Europe, which is pretty problematic. Uh, lots of contracts just define it by number of hours. So we have what's called an hours clause, 168 hours, 504 hours or something, and that takes away a little bit of the subjectivity. But I'm sure from a meteorologist, it's a very different perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, the events that I'm thinking about are, are individual storms um, or individual like grid-based um, co-occurrence, but I think when it comes to the research, I'm happy to be guided by what's useful um, mm -hmm. um, for, for you and, and others. Um, yeah, I have no fixed view on, on what that would be. So and if I what, could add, useful, the catastrophe yeah. models have different event definitions within them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for convective storm, for example, there's one vendor who every single day is a different event, and then a different vendor aggregates events together into kind of micro, macro events rather based on what they think are the atmospheric conditions. So even practitioners who are using these models, you need to be very careful to, you, to make sure you understand what you're modeling and what they think an event is. And is it the same as your contract says is an event? Any other views on events? Yeah, I think for me, I couldn't decide when we were doing the paper, so I did everything from one day to 180 days, so you can pick your favourite. Um, but when we were talking earlier about having small data samples and when you're in the extremes, I think my, from a climate science perspective, my preferred event definition is a day. Maybe you'd accrue a few days rain before that, or like the maximum 72 hour gust over a period. But that just gives you the most number of points, right? Um, if you start doing average over five days and you only got extreme events, you run out of data quite quickly. Mm. Um, so although from an impact perspective, that might be much more useful. Um, yeah, we need guidance to do that. 
Thanks very much. Um, I think the next question was in the middle here. Hi, um, Albertine from Columbia Thrifty Law Investment. Sorry, my question, less academic, probably more big scale. It was to you, Rowan. You mentioned um, <laughs> you mentioned that the insurance sector might become, I think you said, the valve to which yeah. of most finance. So, you know, I work in asset management, but asset management banks can maybe understand and quantify this risk a bit better. Um, my question really is, just could you explain how you see that working, how you could get involved with that, and how some of the information that is available in the insurance sector can be applied to the longer time frames and the broader asset classes that we have to look at um, as asset managers? Sure, uh, absolutely. And, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that banks and asset managers can't understand this risk. I'm just, it's just a case that necessarily insurers and reinsurers have had to over three decades now since the uh, early 90s have had to invest so much money and sort of it's almost changed the demography of the industry hasn't it so it would be a shame not for the other sectors to at least piggyback off some of that as well as add to it so I'll, I'll try and come up with an, an, an example and then but I don't absolutely know the answer to your question but I want to sort of illustrate a pathway so those of us who haven't come here from abroad, we, we sort of take it for granted that we need insurance when we have a mortgage. It's, uh, there's actually about seven acts of parliament or other legislative mechanisms which drive about 90% of UK insurance. So the fact that we all buy uh, or have to have insurance when we have a mortgage is because there was a clause in, a, in an act of parliament in the 1930s which allowed banks to require people to have insurance. Uh, that was just one example. It's, a, it's just one little clause. I actually was so boring, I was just a nerd, I looked it up. Because <laughs> uh, I was thinking, well, it's going to be the same with climate. There's going to be a few clauses and a few obscure contracts that actually drive the market. So that's why if you went to the US or many other countries in the world, you simply don't need to have insurance to have a mortgage. So actually, uh, the bank uh, may well have a liability to understand. In the US, if your house gets blown down or, or flooded or whatever, you can literally hand the keys back to the, to the landlord, uh, sorry, to the, to the bank, and it's their problem. In the UK, it's your problem. So, mm -hmm. so we should never, it's, it's a bit like, a, so, sorry, but there was a, a presentation downstairs when people talked about people withdrawing wildfire coverage in, in California right now. And, and partly, it's one of the reasons, is because in the US, the rates that people can charge for insurance are regulated by elected insurance commissioners who put restrictions on what people can charge. So uh, it, it's not always just about a fear of, of, of the risk. It's, so we take for granted the environment we're in here in the UK and assume that's how it is everywhere else. But going back to the exam question. So effectively, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna probably say things that shouldn't be recorded, but in a way, <laughs> A bank doesn't have to worry in the UK quite so much as in other countries about its exposure to flood and other risks in, in, the, in the UK because fundamentally the liability is on the person taking out the mortgage and the insurer should pick up the tab. It is the, in that case, the bank is quite understandably subcontracting the decision of is this house too risky to insure or too risky to, for, to, to give a loan to because it should be the insurance company's job to decide whether that is insurable and at what price and in the UK because insurance is always a public-private partnership. We developed something called Flood Read to help you know 500,000 homes in, in, in uh, exposed locations but put some conditions that supposedly you can't build new homes in floodplains. So in effect and someone, and actually insurers withdrawing coverage from certain places is sometimes perhaps the ultimate risk signal. They may want to make money in places, but if, if somewhere is too risky to insure adequately, it's actually saying something else, that this place is too risky perhaps to have a home. So what I'm suggesting is that in that example, UK mortgages, banks are effectively using insurers as that valve deciding uh, where they can provide loans in, in flood risk areas. I don't know how that could work in other domains of, of finance, 
but I think it would be quite exciting to see where we could use that. A, to make sure that we have much bigger risk-sharing mechanisms to share these risks as they propagate through the financial system, but also desperately to integrate the platforms and technology, and you know, whether it's, it's new uh, organizations or relatively new organizations like Fathom, who I'm sure are having all these sorts of discussions with different parts of the financial and corporate sector. Well, wouldn't it be exciting if as well as that, we could, through groups like yours, um, we could, Paul, we could, we could knit things together to create an integrated financial system that dealt with these risks effectively mm. and made sure each cottage industry in the city of London was doing its bit mm. to manage and share. Because ultimately, this is a governance issue. How do we share and manage risk to mm. have a sustainable future? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. So I think you go next. Sir. There's a question for the Rob. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but you said that uh, our exposure was evolving in emerging markets with land use change. And in that arena, I think insurers are facing what they call the protection gap, mm. meaning that people and locations, be it California or Pakistan, can't afford the insurance. But the risk is transmitted down the supply chain into the corporates who depend on, for instance, Pakistan, for textiles and rice and other commodities. Isn't it time for a bigger picture view of applying insurance climate analytics with TNFD on a whole country basis, for instance, issuing sustainability linked green bonds or sovereign bonds that are sustainability linked on a whole country basis. So you connect together, in the case of Pakistan, the cyclone risk coming in one way and the deforestation in the Himalayas silting up the rivers with flooding coming downstream the other way. The two combine and the risk is with Marks and Spencers. Mm. But it's a whole country risk. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll I'll try and give a very quick response. It's probably more of a, a, a response over a drink uh, in the cocktail reception. <laughs> um, but uh, I will take side issue. The reasons why we have massive underinsurance in the developing world, as well as quite considerable underinsurance in the developed world, is not just about affordability. There's all sorts of reasons why we have low insurance penetration around the world. Affordability is, is, is important, but as I said, most insurance is bought because of public policy requirements. You buy it because you have to, and in some countries it's become explicit, and in other countries it's not so explicit. Um, but, your, but your general point is absolutely correct. This risk exists. It is being held by someone. Usually the risk is being held by uh, individuals who can't cope with it, or the sovereign. And we have to make this risk, and that's surely a, a raison d'etre of the CGFI, make implicit risk explicit, see who owns it, and, and understand that we might need to develop a much more radical view of sharing risk within countries and between countries to actually manage, share, and ultimately, hopefully, reduce it. And we need a risk-sharing revolution, just as we had in this country uh, in 1946, 1945, or uh, to over 100 years ago in 1906, 1907. We have completely lost the idea of insurance being an institution of society. We think about it as a rather grim, grotty product. It is not. It is actually how society shares and manages risk and we are not going to confront this issue until we become much more focused and explicit. I was very excited when the Shadow Chancellor talked in a speech in, in, in the US a couple of weeks ago about securonomics. 
I don't quite know what it means, but I like the sound of it. We have to focus on creating a consistent system of making ourselves more secure and clear against these risks so we can then actually have the confidence to grow. May I, I don't want to undercut your point because I think this is very important. I think the protection gap largely exists in residential uh, lines of business. Mm. I mean, commercial lines of business are largely insured across the world, even in the developed world. Um, so just to be aware of that is something that might get in the way of the, of the project. Okay, thanks very much. I'm sorry, we, I'm kind of very aware that we're running out of time. I, I'm kind of, you know, don't want to keep you from your drinks. So I'm not going to take any more questions from the floor. I'm just going to uh, ask for final remarks from the panelists. Um, I guess we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, kind of um, sharing data and understanding uncertainty. We all have our different perspectives. We kind of want to get out of our silos. So my final question is, how do we, how do we keep talking to each other? How do we bridge the gaps in translation between what we're doing in research and what we're doing in finance or even different parts of finance. So maybe we can start with, with Jen to begin with. Well, I guess events like this are a key, key way to, to get us talking to each other and understanding the needs of different groups. Um, I think, sh yeah, sharing data um, so that we can really understand, as Hannah said before, like what events what compound events that we're looking at actually had impacts. Mm. Um, so we, we kind of need, need that information in order to um, better understand the, the compound events. Um, so yeah, keep having events like this where we can talk to each other and share, um, share our knowledge and find out what each other needs, really. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I'd add that if you see a call to industry, I guess, that if you see things that we're doing that look nearly useful, yeah. we are quite flexible, like we, we like to make pretty pictures to put in the papers, but like in theory, the, the methods we use, everything is very adaptable, you know, and all these papers have email addresses on them. Um, <laughs> so you can contact us and be like, oh, this would, this, if you just change this a little bit, this could be really helpful to us, we could use it. That's actually helpful to us because we need to demonstrate impact to our universities. So, like, like literally everyone wins. Um, but I think just don't be afraid to ask if things look potentially useful, but not they're not quite in the right form, which I guess is often the case. Yeah, definitely agree. <laughs> yeah, I've usually found when I write to authors of papers, they're very helpful. Yeah, they're happy Good. to talk about their research. Yeah, I guess for me, I think I think we need a professional class of people who are interpreters. Um, in between the financial sector and, and insurance and the academics. And I guess I'd like to think of myself as one of those people, and I think there are a group of us, <laughs> but I definitely think there needs to be more. There's more of us now in insurance, and I see increasingly ads for banks and investment firms for these kind of professionals, and I think we, we need that because it is a skill, I think, to interpret between the two camps. Get involved in practical, exciting projects together. I mean, that's where it really hits the road, when you get involved in practical, exciting, maybe even commercially relevant projects. There's some great ones happening at CGFI, like obviously the loss, the, the wind and flood. Global Resilience Index, unfortunately Nicola couldn't be with us today, but that's a pretty exciting project that's trying to cut through some of the sort of challenges we've just discussed. But that's when it gets real, that's when it gets exciting. Thank you very much for finishing on that positive note. I'd just like to thank everybody for um, all your questions and your time today. And finally, can we thank the, the panellists for their fantastic presentations and comments. So I think the next item on the agenda is closing remarks. Closing remarks. It says 15 minutes, but don't worry. It'll be, <laughs> it'll be it's, it's only half an hour. No, it's 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Um, big thanks, incidentally, also to Len, but also to uh, Paul, CBFRS, for pulling this panel together. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Right, well, what a day. It's been fantastic. Um, the grandfather was about to hand things back to uh, Ben Caldercott. But, uh, I mean, whether it was Baroness Penn this morning, um, obviously Seabears, uh, the, the talks we had on the Transition Task Force, obviously David and Nature. Those of you who went downstairs at that, at that bifurcation, uh, we had some absolutely ex such exciting uh, new uh, teams and
startups which were presented. I think we had eight presentations from companies that cover quite the range of uh, activities we've been talking about today. So thank you all for uh, showing us uh, your great work. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people coming to talk to you uh, in drinks, of course, uh, finishing with floods. So um, thanks to everybody for staying uh, to, to the end. And uh, we'll have some drinks in a second. I do have uh, some thanks to give, apart from, of course, to, uh, to Ben. Uh, 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 the session leads. Right from the morning, uh, Jacques Morris, uh, Mike Wilkins, uh, Jimena Alvarez, uh, Paul, of course, and Len, uh, Ian Clatcher, and Ashley Sladen. Can I thank all of our session leads? <laughs> Plus all the wider colleagues at, at NERC and Innovate UK who helped make today happen, and of course, also underpin everything that's being done at CGFI uh, and Serif. I uh, want to make a particular uh, thanks to the CGFI uh, central team. So Jimena Alvarez again, uh, Christoph Christian, uh, Yannick Padaher, Alex Horgan, and Alex Jackman. Thank you all so much. <laughs> and as it's been so wonderfully written here, to anyone else that we've missed. So thank you to all of you. Let's go have a drink.